All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the scientific abstract sessions of the uh, 13th annual International Conference on Stigma. My name is Vicki Haverman, and I'm the chair of the conference's scientific committee, as well as the moderator for this session. Um, this year was another competitive year of abstract submissions. The 15 posters presented on the conference portal were selected through a multi-round evaluation process by the scientific committee. From the fantastic research selected for this year's conference, the committee gave three awards. The third place scientific abstract award uh, went to Dr. Joshua Stout for his research entitled The Impact of Stigma and Peer Support on Family and Friends Bereaved by a Drug Overdose Death. The second place scientific abstract award went to Dr. Sharin Sultana for her research entitled, More Than Just a Friend, Shielding from Stigma Through Social Support, an Examination of Poor Bangladeshi Women Living, in, living with HIV. And lastly, the Best Scientific Abstract Award went to Mr. Ikena Nwakanma um, for his research entitled, Mitigating HIV-Related Stigma Through Faith Leader-Led Community Engagements, Evidence from an Impacted ass Assessment of an intervention in Nigeria. So please, um, let's all congratulate all the award winners um, for their excellent research. Um, and now um, it's my pleasure to introduce the third place scientific abstract award winner, Dr. Joshua Stout. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology, Criminology and Criminal Justice at Shepherd University. Dr. Stout's research, in, in, his research interests primarily focus on the opioid epidemic and the war on drugs. His dissertation and recent publications focus on the impact stigma has on bereaved family and friends who lost a loved one to drug overdoses, as well as systems of mutual aid created in the aftermath of such loss. Currently, Dr. Stout is expanding upon his work to examine police responses to opioid overdoses and the historical effects of substance use stigmatization on policies and practices within the criminal justice system. Please welcome Dr. Joshua Stout. Good morning, everybody. Let me just quickly uh, share my screen. It's the wrong one. Always happens that way. All righty. So I had thrown uh, some slides together for today, uh, but in the nature of time, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to get through all of them, but they are available in my uh, poster presentation uh, if you wish to review them and ask any questions. So ultimately, um, I sought to explore the bereavement experience of those who had lost a loved one to an overdose with uh, my co-author and colleague, Benjamin Flory Steiner at University of Delaware. And so uh, the context of the study is, you know, the rising opioid epidemic uh, and in turn the high rates of morbidity and mortality in the United States continues to impact every corner of the United States. However, within this discussion, limited attention and focus has been given towards the families who have lost a loved one. And so we sought to answer two large overarching questions, right? How does the stigma surrounding addiction uniquely impact those closest to individuals who pass away from an overdose death? And in what ways does this stigma impact the mourning process and help seeking behaviors of the bereaved? So we conducted 35 interviews. Um, I'll skip through the demographics. Um, but ultimately, what we found is that multiple interactions following the uh, loss of a loved one to an overdose are very stigmatizing interactions for the bereaved, specifically with the, the cultural and structural stigma surrounding substance use disorder. This creates a courtesy stigma for the bereaved as well, in turn impacting their mourning and grief process. So this is experienced from the very first interactions they have uh, with law enforcement at the time of their loved one's death and continue to be pervasive in the ways that they are alienated uh, by friends and family that they cannot necessarily tap into adequate social support. So if they are going to support groups, they still feel otherized in those interactions. Um, hearing narratives of choice or blame that their loved one did this to themselves and then being bombarded by various feeling rules of how they ought to grieve this loss, all really kind of 
compounding in this way uh, to create this what we call stigmatized bereavement. And one of the, the powerful things is as fatalistic as, as this approach may sound, one thing that we see is, you know, in experiencing the stigmatized bereavement, what it ultimately led our respondents to feel and experience was this sense of spoiled identity, very similar to what uh, Goffman proposes in his work on stigma. But all our respondents really engaged in this very agentic process of beginning to negotiate that stigmatized identity and um, enter into this process of unspoiling uh, that identity. And so what this ultimately means and what we saw this looking like is a host of individuals in our studies became deeply involved in various forms of advocacy, help-seeking behavior, and peer support all creating these systems of mutual aid. So in other words, in experiencing this, this stigma on interactional levels, on structural levels, and on the cultural levels, um, rather than in kind of the Goffmanian way of having this uh, process of concealing or revealing the stigmatized identity, these individuals actively challenge uh, the larger cultural, structural, and interactional stigmas to engage in this process of ultimately unspoiling that identity and creating these large and complex systems of mutual aid to create environments of mutual respect, support, kindness, all to help others through their grief process as well. And so this is really where we see then the the power and the impact of, of peer support and that mutual aid. And so Moving forward, we plan to continue to expand the evaluation of this study, um, but in the nature of time, I wanted to make sure that uh, Akina had time to present on their powerful work as well. So I will end that there, but as I said, uh, the poster is up and available, so if any questions, comments, concerns uh, that you may have, please feel free to shoot me a me message on WOVA and I will do my best to get back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stout. Um, now I'm excited to introduce the Best Scientific Abstract Award winner, Mr. Ikena Nakwanma. He is a Nigerian with over 11 years of experience working in international donor-funded HIV response, as well as on projects related to sexual and reproductive health, maternal and child health, and gender justice. Over the past seven years, uh, Mr. Nakwanma as his career has focused on faith-based public response as both a program technical lead slash technical lead and specialist for HIV prevention care and support. He's currently the co-chair of the Coalition of Civil Society Networks on HIV and AIDS in Nigeria, where he represents the civil society networks working in Nigeria's HIV space on different strategic engagements related to HIV locally and internationally. Uh, Mr. Nakwama has a master's in public health from the French School of Public Health in Paris, France, a postgraduate diploma in HIV education and management, and a bachelor's of science in biochemistry. He is a strong advocate for wellness of the whole person and of all persons. Please welcome Mr. Ikena Nakwama. All right. Hello, um, good afternoon. Oh, good morning. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, all right. So, um, good morning again. Uh, my name is Ikenda. Um, like I've been rightly introduced, and I've been working in HIV space in Nigeria. And um, this work is based on the work we've done uh, with. In Nigeria, the Nigerian Network of Religious Leaders, Stephen Witt, or personal affected by HIV, and um, technical and program lead. Um, in Nigeria is an interfaith organization that's been working in this space for over two decades and has major scope in the area of stigma mitigation, um, care and support for persons living with HIV. And this study is based on the project implemented in partnership with Christian Aid UK in Nigeria. And it was, um, we are studying, looking at um, the impact of an intervention that focused on mitigating stigma 
leveraging the fit platforms. So let me put this here. So as an introduction, um, as evidence suggests, there are about 1.9 million persons living with HIV in Nigeria. And that makes Nigeria the second largest contributor to global epidemic of HIV. And um, um, Nigeria has made tremendous progress in the areas of case finding, in the areas of treatment and in retention in care. And um, there's one thing fear that stigma and discrimination is a threat to sustaining the gains we've made over the years and even in making progress towards achieving the double target of ending HIV by 2030. And also we've seen that there are some erroneous pronouncements of faith and also doctrinal stances that have um, instigated stigma from the faith platforms. And at the same time, evidence suggests that engagement of faith leaders um, have uh, given some success stories in the areas of um, fight against stigma and discrimination because we know the faith leaders um, have the moral authority and the influence over their congregants that can shape opinion and behaviors. And so what this project actually did was leverage on that platform, that powerful, sustainable, and well-networked faith platforms to reach the people and to shape opinions and behaviors in, in relation to HIV stigma. So the objective of this study is to assess the potency of that um, faith-based strategy um, in mitigating stigma and also to assess the sustainability of that intervention and actually also draw from there to see how much similar interventions um, related to HIV or other health, program, health programs um, can be sustained in fit platforms. So, and the project was termed Strengthening Fit based HIV Response. And like I mentioned earlier, it was developed and implemented between Dinerella and Christian Aid UK, Nigeria. So the project's objective were first to empower the faith communities with the right information on HIV and also to help them um, in engaging their faith congregations to mitigate those faith interferences and against HIV services. And also to empower faith leaders to work as advocates of HIV stigma elimination. The intervention leverage on the moral authorities of the faith leaders to shape opinion and also to, um, you know, to counter those erroneous narratives that are put out there that instigate stigma and discrimination in relation to HIV. And also to provide that HIV literacy that will help um, address stigma at the population level. And the project was very participatory in the sense that at every stage of the project, um, the faith leaders we are all part of the process at the design level, at the implementation level, and even at the assessment levels. So it was totally owned and driven by the faith leaders and faith communities. So the project again um, developed two important tools, which we are used first to empower the faith leaders. One of them was the simplified version of the of Nigeria's anti-discrimination law. In 2014, Nigeria passed the anti HIV anti-discrimination law. But unfortunately, the law has not been very popular in the sense that many people do not even know about the law. Even the persons living with HIV who are supposed to benefit from the law are not aware of the existence of the law. And realizing or recognizing the importance of faith. So this project um, simplified that law using verses from the Bible and Quran to interpret every component of the law. And so another important tool that was developed was a salmon guide. This simple document was just a tool that was used to support faith leaders on how to communicate on issues related to HIV, the, the what to say and what not to say. Because we know sometimes, knowingly or knowingly, the way things are communicated might instigate, um, actually amplify stigma and discrimination against persons living with HIV. So these tools were developed and they used to um, build the capacity of 80 religious leaders um, in two states in Nigeria. And a three-day training was conducted for them. And um, also they were supported to develop a work plan on how they will engage their congregations. So they also were supported to conduct series of engagements at the congregation level. So they engaged the different groups um, in their congregation from their co-faith leaders to other groups at the congregation level. And this ran for a period of two years. And also they engaged the community at large. And um, also uh, the faith leaders we are supported 
to implement some other activities, like leveraging the Fed platforms to do case finding, particularly in the area of pediatric case finding, because we know that most of the times women who are pregnant do not even go to hospitals, but they attend churches and mosques. So if, if we miss them at the hospitals, we know that we cannot miss them in the congregations. So we liberate that platform to identify, track, test, screen, and link these women who were positive, who are HIV positive, who are pregnant, and also supported those who are positive to access care. So that was actually the cascade um, and what and what this intervention did in summary at the Fed congregation. So here we are looking at the sample of um, the simplified version of that anti-discrimination art. Um, we have at the very first, the first, part, first paragraph speaks to what the law says. So the different other paragraphs that talk about uh, actually present different verses from the Bible and Quran that actually interpreting or supporting the provisions of the law. So what this means is that people are not meant to look at this, the issue around stigma discrimination as just obeying the law, but an act of faith. So in a way that it appeals to their conscience, not just the way that makes them obey the law. So this tool was used effectively in the faith communities. So in the methodology, um, this study actually compared data collected in 20 intervention congregations and 20 control congregations. So the intervention congregations are the congregations that are involved in the project. And the 20 control congregations are those that did not participate in that um, intervention. So they are just but in the same location, the same geographical location. So we compare data between these two groups. Data was collected at baseline, at the end of the project, that's end term, and also at follow up you know, two years after, at the, at the end of the project. So at baseline, we developed a tool that actually um, we used to collect data in key areas using different uh, indicators of interest. So we use that to capture the data and focusing on different congregations that location, but the 20 intervention congregations, we are among the um, access or surveyed congregations. Also, um, at the end term, we also use the same tool that we use at the baseline to collect data in, 20, in the 20 intervention congregations and then in the 20 control congregations. We did that again at follow up. Uh, that was two years after the project using the same tool and collected the data in the 20 intervention congregations and the 20 control congregations. And then we analyzed the data um, used um, descriptive statistics and also um, regression analysis to look at the associations. So the outcomes of interest in the assessments we are one, to assess willingness to accept HIV positive results. Again, also to assess willingness to receive communion with a person living with HIV, and also to assess knowledge of HIV prevention amongst the population. So from the result, we um, here we have that in the in the baseline survey, we had about 430 persons that we are actually surveyed at, at baseline. 51.2% um, of them were females. And at um, end term, we had 250 persons um, surveyed in the intervention and control congregations, 250 persons, 250 persons each, making the 500. And then at follow up, we had 260 at the intervention and 250 at the control, control congregation. So this gave us um, a total of 510 inter, um, um, data um, persons reached in the intervention and then 500 in the control group. And then, um, so at, uh, we had from the data analysis, we had, um, we saw that about 26.7%, we saw about 26.7% increase in the likelihood of to accept HIV positive result in the intervention group as compared to 18.3% in the control group. So also has saw this significant um, increase in willingness to receive communion in intervention group as 70% versus 8.3% as compared to the um, control group. So for in the area of um, comparing knowledge score at baseline and knowledge score at follow-up stages for the intervention and the control groups. So we, we had this, for the intervention group, we saw a difference, about 23.1 difference increase higher in, in, in the intervention group. Why the knowledge score for, inter, for the persons that received um, at the intervention group was 71.5 at follow-up stage. At baseline stage was 48.4, which is like an increase of 23.1%. At, um, 
at con the control group, we saw that knowledge score at follow up stage was 55.7. And um, that of, again, compared to the baseline, which was 8.4. So it was a difference of about 7.3%. That was a significant difference in terms of uh, um, what uh, the impact of, of the intervention in these two groups. So uh, in conclusion, we saw that um, we were able to see um, a very significant change in attitude and level of knowledge, HIV literacy, um, based on this intervention. And also we saw that adopting the participatory approach in the intervention ensures sustainability of the, of the intervention, even two years after the project ended. So I mean, one quick recommendation is that um, this is repl replicable. We can replicate that in other communications because we know that even where we have no functional government systems, we have functional fit communities. So if we can leverage on these platforms to implement or to intervene in other public health, public health uh, problems, HIV and others, and even mental health as it has become a problem now, particularly amongst persons who are stigmatized and also those who have other health problems. It's obvious and evidence-based that faith communities provide a lot in supporting these public interventions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nakwam. Uh, we really appreciate your presentation. Unfortunately, um, we are short on time and do not have um, enough time to have live, uh, live Q&A, but please reach out to our speakers um, to ask questions and engage with them. And also please join us on Thursday, November 17th. There will be presentations um, for all the scientific posters throughout the day. Um, and our si second place scientific abstract award winner, Dr. Sharin Sultana, is presenting tomorrow in the international session at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful day.